6 o'clock. Um, do you know of anybody else that's coming from any of y'all's teams? No. No clue. Probably not. Okay. Well, we're going to get started either way. If people trickle in, they can come in. Um, I've got a lot of stuff to cover in two hours, so we're going to get to it. Let me dim the lights. Okay. Can you guys see that okay? Okay. Can you tell it's pink? No. No? It's supposed to be pink. It's like happy baby color. No? Okay. Okay, so for those of you guys who don't know me, my name's Emma. I'm a fourth year, um, and as I was telling some of the folks earlier, I made these PowerPoints um, as a study strategy for me for my step two. So I went back through all my notes, all my little books and study aids that I used when I was in uh, third year clerkships and kind of compiled everything together in this PowerPoint. It's in a question and answer format, so you know the question will be up first, and then we'll see if anyone has an idea of what the answer is. Um, you know, I'll click the button and then the answer will come up. So very low stress. I'm not going to, like, go down the row and pimp anybody. But, you know, if you participate, yell out answers when you know them, I think you'll get more out of it. Uh, and it'll be less awkward for me. So your participation will be appreciated. Um, and I'm going to go straight through for two hours. So please don't think you're going to offend me if you have to get up, use the potty, get a drink, leave if it sucks. All of that's fine. So um, any questions before we get started? I tried to hit the high yield stuff. All right, so we'll start with babies. We've got a newborn. Pulse is 130. The baby is acrocyanotic, grimaces to stimulation, moves all extremities, and is crying. APGAR score for our new little friend. So pulse of 130. Does the baby get full points for a pulse? Yes, because yes, it's over 100, so two points for that. What about for color? Yeah, so we lose a point for color, only one if it's acrocyanotic, and that's blue on the hands and feet. Grimaces to stimulation, that's minus one. To get full points for withdraw, they've got to withdraw from the stimulation. So grimace is going to be minus one. Moving all extremities, can't get much better than that, that's two. And crying, that's two for respiration. So this baby's got an APGAR score of eight. So what does the APGAR tell you? They almost always try to integrate a question on this somewhere. So what does it tell you? Yeah, so for Harlingen, what they're saying is it gives us a picture of what the baby looks like at birth. So, and specifically, the one-minute APGAR score tells us how the baby tolerated labor, how if it was distressed, if it was okay. Uh, and then the five-minute tells us how it, the baby is responding to the stimulation and the resuscitative effects. Uh, what's more important and what's commonly a tricky wrong answer on the shelf is what the app guard doesn't tell you. And what's that? Yeah, so it's not predictive. It does not tell you if this baby's going to be brain damaged, have ADD, have mental retardation, doesn't tell us any of that. And it also should never direct resuscitative or direct treatment. So it's just a snapshot in time. Tells us what the baby's doing at that one minute and the five minutes. So it does not guide therapy. Your clinical reasoning does, and it does not predict outcome for the child. So those are important things to remember about the APGAR score. You want to make sure you got that question right. You can miss some other ones, but we'll get the APGAR one right. Okay, so now we're examining these precious little babies in the newborn nursery, and we're assessing a moral reflex on a large for gestational age infant. The right arm remains extended and is medially rotated. So what's wrong with this kiddo? So you can do it, right? Medially rotated, kind of like somebody wants a tip of some kind. Clumpy, clumpy is, clumpy is the claw, so this is herbs. This is herbs palsy. Um, and they may go all step one on you and ask you about the nerve roots. Probably not, though. I think if you can pick it out in a clinical vignette, you'll be okay there. Um, the key for treatment is there is neurosurgery that's available to fix it. If it doesn't go away on its own by three to six months, you refer for surgery. They can surgically correct these now. So we've got another large for gestational age baby, and we're palpating the clavicles, and we feel crepitus and discontinuity. So what is that a sign of? Clavicle fracture, very good. And more importantly, they're going to ask you what we need to do for this baby. Very good. So very different from adult medicine. Uh, usually the child, the newborn's bones are much more apt to remodeling, so they're going to form a callus, no treatment's needed. 
Um, I've read some places that you can use a figure of eight splint like you do in adults, but not necessary. Okay, so what about my first little kiddo with the funny shaped head? And if you palpated the baby, you might feel edema that crosses suture lines. Cap it. Very good. So edema, it's pitting. You know, like the people who have pitting edema on the legs? These babies, you can leave a thumbprint in their head. So that's edema, it's spongy, and it does cross the suture lines. That's cap it. And what about my other little friend? Um, well, if they, maybe the picture's not the greatest, but if the description tells you it's fluctuant when you palpate it, and the fluctuance doesn't cross suture lines. Yeah, so this kiddo just happens to have them bilaterally. I couldn't find a picture where it was just one. But you see down the middle of the suture, it's not crossing, crossing the suture lines. He's got them on both sides. So, so just remember that. Whether or not the swelling crosses the suture lines is a big distinguishing factor between caput and cephalohematoma. All right, cute baby rashes. So this first one, it might be described as a blue slate gray macule on the back or thigh. Good. And what are they made of? If you biopsied that little lesion, melanocytes. Very good. Two extra points for you. Just kidding. I can't do that. So they're arrested melanocytes. That's what the, what the Mongolian spots are made up of. Okay. So our second little baby has pale pink vascular macules on the nuchal area or the face. Um, the facial ones tend to disappear, but the ones on the neck can persist into adolescence, and these get like more red if the kid gets angry or does sports. Salmon patch. This is the nevus simplex. So hemangiomas are more sharply demarcated um, and redder and don't tend to be on the face and nuchal area. So the location should be a helpful factor in determining nevus simplex. So face, nuchal area, the facial, facial ones will regress, the nuchal ones will stick around. Okay, so our little baby with the hat over his eyes. Um, you can't really see them very well in this picture, but they'd be described as firm white papules. You'll see them on day of life number one, and they're filled with keratin milia. Good. So what do you not want to confuse this with? Other little bumpy things on a baby's face. Neonatal acne. So what's the difference? Size, not so much. Um, timing. Timing. You won't see neonatal acne on day of life one. It typically doesn't show up until week of life, maybe one or two. So we'll see that in a little bit. So this third baby, or the fourth baby, the lesions, I don't know if you can see them, they might be described as firm yellow-white pustules and papules on an erythematous base. You might see them on day of life number two. Very good, erythema toxicum. And what are they filled with if you took a biopsy? Eosinophils, very good, very good. Okay, so in baby number five, here's your bright red, sharply demarcated, raised lesion usually occurs in the first couple months. Yeah, here's your hemangioma. So they're typically smaller and they're raised, so they're palpable. The nevus simplex or the salmon patch, typically you can't run your fingers across it. Um, and here, baby number six, this might happen on week of life one or two, erythematous papules, these are the neonatal acne. So I think time is the biggest clue there in determining between milia and neonatal acne. Um, and neonatal acne, just like in adolescence, um, or if you're unfortunate like me in uh, your 20s, it's due to what? What causes acne in these babies? Yeah, hormones. Same, same reason. Same reason it occurs in adolescence. So it's just the maternal androgens that are high circulating levels in the baby. All right. So what about this kiddo? What's on his face? Nevis sebaceous, Seberi is the next one. So nevis sebaceous, you might see it described as an area of alopecia. So you see there's not hair growing in that lesion. Um, and the skin is orange colored and it's nodular if you run your, your fingers across it. And what do we do with these lesions? Are they just going to piece out on their own like some of our other cutaneous? 
Very good. So we remove these before adolescence because they do have a risk of malignant degeneration. So nevus sebaceous, this nodular orange lesion needs to be removed. Here's our seborrheic dermatitis, um, a common name for this. It's on the baby's head, like a little cap, cradle cap. Um, and what do we do for this? Antifungal or a mild shampoo. Usually it's pretty easy to get rid of. Um, you treat it similarly in adults. It's a bigger deal in adults because it usually only happens in adults with HIV or AIDS. But in babies, it just happens in babies. So gently cleanse it. Sometimes they'll tell you to put the shampoo on a toothbrush, a soft toothbrush, and scrub the lesions. Okay. So any questions about skin findings you might see on a neonate? They might show you a picture. More often, though, they're going to describe it. So when you're studying, keep in mind those keywords that kind of distinguish each of the lesions from each other. Any questions? Fair enough. All right, so on the neonatal screen, it varies slightly between states, but there are two disorders that are always screened for, and it's important to catch them early um, because it can lead to disastrous consequences if the baby's allowed to breastfeed. Galactosemia and PKU. Very good. So PKU, um, you remember this from biochemistry or from step one, it's a deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase. And the symptoms, you don't see them right away. In galactosemia, you see the symptoms right from birth because galactose can cross the placenta and starts to affect the baby when it's still in utero. PKU, we don't see the symptoms until a couple months later. Uh, and you start seeing delay in development, signs of mental retardation, and then there are those classic signs with the white hair, the kind of musty, mousy odor that they often describe in, in questions. In galactosemia, it's a problem with this G1P uridyl transferase that you probably remember from biochemistry, uh, and it, it uh, causes this precursor, G1P, to accumulate and cause damage to a lot of the different organs in the body. Uh, and these cataracts, um, jaundice, seizures, all of these findings are found right from birth because galactose can cross the placenta. So these are a big deal because there's obviously lactose in breast milk and there's also phenylalanine. Okay. So a yellow baby. Lots of questions on your test, at least two probably, about neonatal jaundice just because there are so many different reasons um, and treatment is important. So if we have a yellow baby that is three days old, the billy is 10, and the direct fraction, or the direct bilirubin, is only 0.5, um, and the baby's pretty much okay, eating and pooping well, what would we suspect to be the mechanism or the problem? Yeah, so this is just physiologic jaundice. It's physiologic if it's gone by day five, uh, and it's just because the neonate's liver isn't mature enough to fully conjugate all the bilirubin that it's taken in. So physiolo physiologic jaundice before day of life five, and the bilirubin usually isn't higher than 12 or 15. So what about another yellow baby? Seven days old, the bilirubin is 12, direct bilirubin is 0 0.5, but the mucous membranes are dry and the baby's not gaining weight. Breastfeeding? Yes. So breastfeeding is kind of a misnomer, which is why it's hard sometimes to remember. They really should call it lack of breastfeeding jaundice, right? Because the problem is the baby's not getting enough breast milk. Baby, baby's either not latching on well or not sucking well or the mom's not feeding frequently enough or for long enough. And you'll see all of those clues in the question stem. So um, you can pick this out in a clinical vignette because the baby will often have signs of dehydration as well as the jaundice. So... What about our third baby who's 14 days old? Billy is 12, direct is 0.5, and the baby had regained its birth weight and is otherwise healthy. Breast milk jaundice, very good. So this baby, in contrast to baby number two, doesn't have those signs of dehydration. They're getting adequate calories from the breast milk. The problem here is that there's an enzyme in breast milk called glucuronidase, and it deconjugates the bilirubin in the infant's GI tract and causes the indirect bilirubin fraction to increase. So our last baby is one day old. Billy Rubin is 14, direct is 0.5. Are we worried about this kiddo? Yeah, so high Billy Rubin in the first 24 hours of life is always a problem. That's always a cause for concern. Um, it's always pathologic, so to speak. So it's always pathologic if it occurs on day of life one, if it's over 12 at any time, 
um, or the direct bilirubin is over two. And also a fast rate of rise is cause for concern. So what do we want to do is our next best test. Shelves love these questions, right? What is the next best test in the workup of your patient? Very good. Very good. You'll want to do a Coombs test. Why? Yeah, because you want to see, well, we already have a clue that it's hemolytic anemia or there's hemolysis because the indirect bilirubin um, is up. And we can tell by Coombs whether, well, yeah, we can tell if it's hemolyzing. We can tell if there are antibodies on the baby's red blood cells causing the problem. So if Coombs is positive, it means we've got an incompatibility issue. And it's negative, there's something else, either a twin-twin transfusion, maternal fetal transfusion, um, or a variety of other problems, including problems with the fetal red blood cell like spherocytosis um, or other problems with the membrane. Okay, so still on yellow babies. This one is seven days old. The urine is dark. The stool is pale. Bilirubin is 12, but direct bilirubin is 8, in contrast to our other patients. And here the LFTs are also elevated, which gives us a clue. What's up with this baby? Yeah, so this is classic biliary atresia. The LFTs are elevated, you know, it tells us something in that neck of the woods is not going well. Um, and it's a direct bilirubinemia, which always causes us concern. So in bili biliary atresia, it's a congenital problem. The bile ducts are atretic, so the bile can't drain. It backs up, goes into the blood, and causes the jaundice. Um, and this is a surgical urgency, if not emergency, because it will cause liver failure if not surgically corrected. So some other causes of direct hyperbilirubinemia. You see a baby, maybe their LFTs aren't high, but it's a baby that's got high direct bilirubin. What's the first thing you want to make sure you rule out? Obstruction would probably give us some kind of liver, pro liver signs, at least in terms of LFTs, especially with little babies that can't tell us how they're feeling. I'm being too esoteric. So you always want to rule out sepsis. Sepsis is a potential cause of a direct hyperbilirubinemia, and that's always one you want to rule out first by doing a pan culture, just like you do with the baby who has a fever. Some other random causes, uh, galactosemia, hypothyroidism can, prevent, can present with direct hyperbilirubinemia, cholidococyst, not a atresia, but just a cyst on the duct, and then cystic fibrosis also. So this is back to step one again, random inherited causes of an indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Named for dead guys. Gil Bears and Kriegler Najar. Which one is worse? Kriegler Najar. Very good. So in Gil Bears syndrome, it's just a, a decrease in the glucuronal transferase. In Kriegler Najar, at least in type 1, it's a total deficiency. Um, and that's a problem. So uh, two more dead guys. Random causes of, an, of uh, direct hyperbilirubinemia. Rotors and Dubin Johnsons. Very good. So uh, these are problems not with glucuronidation, but with um, secretion or absorption. So Dubin Johnsons and Rotors, the only difference that I ever remembered is if you happen to look at the liver, it's black in Dubin Johnson, and in ro Rotor, it's not black. How that's important clinically, I'm not sure. Okay, so why do we care about this at all? High bilirubin in our babies, why do we care? Very good. So we care, especially in the indirect bilirubin, because it can cross the blood-brain barrier. And it causes cronicterus because it deposits in certain places in the brain. And those, the two places that you probably should be aware of for your exam are the basal ganglia and the cranial nerve nuclei. Those are the, place that, the places that indirect bilirubin will preferentially deposit. Um, and we particularly worry, the cutoff for extreme worry, I guess, would be if bilirubin is over 20. And what do we do? How do we fix this hyperbilirubinemia? So if it's really severe, especially if it's over 20, we're definitely going to do an exchange transfusion. What if it's not quite that severe? What would we try first? The spa, the, spa, the tanning salon, for a little phototherapy. And how does that help? Good. So they're saying here, Harlingen, that it isomerizes the indirect bilirubin. And that's important to remember because there will always be an answer choice that says conjugates it or turns it into direct bilirubin, and that's not the case. It isomerizes it, which somehow chemically makes it more soluble and able to be excreted, but it does not turn it into direct. 
Okay, very good. Questions about jaundice? It's a fairly big topic in the newborn section. All right, so let's talk about some respiratory disorders in the newborn. So we've got a baby. He's in respiratory distress. His abdomen is scaphoid, and he has this chest X-ray. What do you notice on this chest X-ray? Yes, so all of that bowel should not be where the lungs are, right? That is abnormal. So that's our biggest concern. Well, what's our biggest concern about that? Guts in the thorax, who cares? Can't breathe because our lungs can't develop, right? So this is a diaphragmatic hernia. That's what allowed the bowel to come into the chest. And we're concerned about pulmonary hypoplasia because this was going on during development as well. So the lungs aren't able to develop normally with all that gut getting in the way. So we're worried about pulmonary hypoplasia. That's what's going to kill this baby if we don't treat it. And how do we treat it? Surgery. Do we do surgery? So catch the baby, throw him in the OR? I say it that way because it's no, right? When's the best time to do surgery? A couple days later. You want to give the lungs some time to mature. Three or four days is the optimum time between birth to surgery. Um, there will be an answer choice that says, you know, deliver the baby or deliver the baby in a delivery room adjacent to an OR or something like that. They like to ask the question, you know, a mother knows she has a baby with a diaphragmatic hernia. What's the best advice to give this mother prior to delivery? A, have her deliver in a delivery room adjacent to an OR. B, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, usually the right answer is have her deliver at a facility with ECMO capability, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. That's been the right answer, at least in the questions that I've seen. Okay, so another baby with respiratory distress has excess drooling, drooling baby who can't breathe. What does that make us think of? Esophageal atresia, or a TE fistula, yep. So the, the best diagnostic test for this? Yeah, so very low tech, right? Shove something down its nose and take a picture. And if it coils in the thorax, you know it can't go all the way down to the stomach. Uh, what else should we look for? Pediatrics loves this business. So we found TE fistula, fistula. we're going to look for other things in the Vactral Association. So particularly, the question, the right answer might be renal sonogram. It might be skeletal survey to look for radial anomalies. So keep that in your mind, that association, other anomalies that present with TE fistula. So what about our third baby who makes it, you know, it's about a week old um, and becomes cyanotic when feeding, but when she cries, she pinks up. What's that? Coenal atresia. So that's coenal atresia. And here's the other pediatric style question. What else do we look for? There's an association that includes coenal atresia. Charge, good. So coloboma, heart defects, growth retardation, GU anomalies, ear anomalies, and deafness. I'll go with charge. Good. Okay, so these are newborns. The first is a 32-week-old preemie born with dyspnea, respiratory rate that's 80, nasal flaring, and this chest X-ray um, they might either give it to you to look at or they might tell you that it has ground glass opacities with air bronchograms and atelectasis. So it's that. That's respiratory distress syndrome. It's RDS. So how do we diagnose this prenatally? Ideally before the mom delivers. Yeah, the LS ratio. I can never pronounce the word that starts with L. Let, let this in, let this in, sphingomyelin ratio. If it's less than two, there's a bigger chance of having RDS. So ideally, we'd like to test the amniotic fluid for that before the mom delivers. Um, if we catch it early, we can give antenatal betamethasone to help stimulate um, lung maturation. So what's the problem in RDS, the pathophysiology? Yeah, so there's not enough surfactant. Without surfactant, we can't keep the alveoli open. That's why we see the atelectasis and ground glass stuff on the chest x-ray. And that's why the baby can't breathe. So how do we treat it? Very good. So one of the wrong answers is typically going to be theophylline. When do we use theophylline in the NICU? 
Yeah, so if it's central apnea, if it's problems with respiratory drive. In babies with RDS, they don't have problems breathing. They have problems oxygenating. So giving theophylline is not going to help. That's a common wrong answer that they give. So our second kiddo is a 38-week-old, large for gestational age infant, born via C-section to a diabetic mom. And the kid was dysnic and grunting at birth. So what's that? TTN. And what are, I have given you the chest x-ray. What are kind of the buzzwords that go with that? Perihilar streaking because of fluid, right? It retained fluid in the fissures, the perihilar streaking, um, and sometimes air trapping. You see that that chest x-ray looks more black, looks like it's got air trapped in there. So uh, that's the characteristic chest x-ray for TTN. And what's the problem in TTN? Yeah, retained fluid. And they say that C-section is a risk factor for this because you can't, the baby can't go through the birth canal and have the physical expulsion of that lung fluid. Uh, I think I had an attending say that that wasn't true, but I've read books where it says it is true. So it's kind of one of those times where um, what you do on the shelf is not what you do in life, and that sucks, but it's kind of how it is sometimes. So prognosis for these kiddos, super good. It's one of the best lung diseases to have if you're a newborn. So typically you just supplement them with O2 for a couple days, and they're fine. So our last baby, 41-week um, AGA infant, born after rupture of membrane yielded greenish-brown fluid. Are we worried about this kiddo? Yeah, we're very worried about meconian aspiration syndrome. Um, and you can see this kind of looks like pneumonia. They might describe the chest x-ray with patchy infiltrates um, because it is. It's a type of aspiration pneumonia. So uh, meconian aspiration syndrome, next best step. If you're the pediatrician in the delivery room, what do you do when you catch the baby? Yes, before stimulation. Because they, they might have your answer choices, so this baby's born, we knew that the meconium had stained because it was greenish brown fluid. Um, you know, the, what do you do after birth? One of the wrong answers would be you know, stimulation, uh, drying, all the normal stuff that you usually do when a baby's born. So you want to intubate and suction before any of that because you don't want the child to further aspirate that material into their lungs. So complications of this? Yeah. Um, so pneumonia, pneumonitis, and because there are problems uh, with all of that meconium in the lungs, it causes pulmonary artery hypertension because blood can't effectively flow through. Okay. So GI problems in our little babies. What's this? Okay, very good. And it's lateral to the midline, doesn't have a sac. And that's how you tell it from omphalocele, right? So is gastroschisis associated with other anomalies? Not usually. Not usually. Um, we can diagnose gastroschisis early because you'll see um, elevated maternal uh, alpha feta protein. But no, there's not usually an association with other disorders. Complications? What's the problem for these kids? Dehydration, sure, um, and mal malnutrition. And usually the problem, the long-term problems come because the bowel is exposed, it can get scarred down. And that requires bowel resection, can lead to short gut syndrome, and all of the problems that that causes down the road. So this uh, second picture, it's midline, got a sac. That's emphalocele. Associated with other disorders? You betcha, which ones? Beckwith-Wiedemann is probably the one you'll get asked about. Um, and they love to describe this baby. It's a big baby got a big tongue, so you can kind of confuse it with hypothyroidism a little bit because of that. It's a big baby with a big tongue. Ear pits is the, is the key. Remember when you flipped the little baby's ears over and you looked for pits in the newborn nursery? If you found one, you might be thinking back with Wiedemann syndrome, and emphalocele is associated with it also. Okay, so what about this third little cute baby? Small little defect in the midline. Yeah, so this is an umbilical hernia. Uh, associated with other disorders? Yes, which one? Hypothyroidism. Very good. So that's our other baby with a big tongue. Big tongue plus umbilical hernia equals hypothyroidism. And what do we do to treat it? Or do we treat it? It should go away. And if it doesn't go away, by when are we worried? 
Yeah, two or three. If it's still there and the kid's two or three, consider surgery. But if you're given a case of a one-year-old and the mom's freaking out because of an umbilical hernia, you tell her to cool her jets and it'll probably go away on its own. Okay, a vomiting baby. Got a four-week-old infant, non-bilious vomiting, and a palpable olive. Okay, good. So we look forward to that question, right, on the exam, pyloric stenosis. The metabolic complication? Very good. Hypochloremic, because you're vomiting up your HCL, metabolic alkalosis. Very good. How do we treat it? Got to cut it. Myotomy. You got to snip the, the stenotic part of the pyloric sphincter. So what about a two-week-old infant bilious vomiting? The pregnancy was complicated by polyhydramnios. And has that abdominal x-ray shown? Yeah, it's some type of atresia. Um, duodenal here, we've got the double bubble, so that x-ray is duodenal atresia. Um, but any intestinal atresia could conceivably cause polyhydramnios and um, bilious vomiting. Annular pancreas is another way that the, the intestines can be narrowed. So associations? Good. Down syndromes is the biggest, especially if we're talking about duodenal atresia. Uh, One-week-old baby with bilious vomiting draws up his legs and has abdominal distension. Yes. So malrotation leading to volvulus. And remember these LADS bands? I had forgotten about that when I was studying. Um, those are the things during development that persist, and uh, they're little pieces of peritoneum that kink the duodenum, and that's what causes the volvulus. So pathophysiology, if it's malrotation, we didn't have that 270-degree counterclockwise rotation that you, I'm sure, remember from embryology back in first year. So, okay, pooping problems. A three-day-old newborn has still not passed meconium. Two things on your differential. CF and her sprungs. Very good. So meconium ileus is an early presenting sign of uh, cystic fibrosis, especially if there's a positive family history. And oddly enough, um, a gastrographin enema is diagnostic and therapeutic for a meconium ileus. Hirschsprung's disease, remember that's the classic clinical picture if you do the digital rectal exam, it's like a big poo explosion. And then uh, we don't do it anymore, but the gold standard in diagnosis is taking a biopsy and looking for sections of rectum that don't have ganglia. Um, so another kid with pooping problems is a five-day-old former 33-weeker who develops bloody diarrhea. Yes, so this is bad. Necrotizing enterocolitis is bad. What do you see on x-ray? What's the buzzword? So I heard it both ways. Pneumocystis intestinalis is the fancy pants word. It's air bubbles in the wall of the intestine. That's what you would see. So treatment of neck. Resection, if it gets bad enough, if it's necrotic, definitely. Uh, more, more conservative treatment is keeping the baby MPO, giving nutrition um, parenterally, and giving antibiotics. So stopping feeding is really the most important thing to do first. And risk factors for neck, prematurity, uh, and some people say introducing feedings too soon. Early introduction of feeding has been associated with it, especially if the gut is premature. All right, so our last baby is a two-month-old with colicky abdominal pain, current jelly stool with a sausage-shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. You like those buzzwords? Intestception. And for here, uh, with meconium ileus, gastrographin enema is diagnostic and therapeutic. In intestception, barium enemas are diagnostic and therapeutic. So that's the next best step if you're asked a question about that. Okay, so GU disorders. Newborn male with no palpable testes. Is that a problem? Where are they? Where are the testes? I don't know. Where are they usually? Where do we usually find them? Inguinal canal. Very good. And the next best test, if we can't find them in the inguinal canal? Ultrasound. You got to look for them elsewhere in the abdominal cavity. So cryptorchidism, the association there is with something called prune belly syndrome. Have you guys heard of this before? It's a problem where the ventral musculature of the abdomen doesn't form. That's why it looks like a prune, because you see all the little uh, intestine peristalsis moving around. So um, it's just a 
developmental disorder. You have failure of the ventral musculature to form and also cryptorchidism is associated. So when do we do surgery for these little babies with cryptorchidism? Yeah, by one year if they're not descended on their own, why? Does it decrease the risk of cancer to bring them down? Absolutely. So that's, a, that's an important distinction to remember. Um, bringing, surgically descending the testes does not decrease the risk for cancer, but it makes them more palpable, so when the kid gets old enough, he could find it sooner than if they were still in the abdomen. Okay, so a newborn male with a urethral opening in the ventral surface of the penis. What's that? Hypospadias. And what do you not do to a kid with hypospadias? Circumcise, yeah, because the foreskin is used by the urologist for repair later in life. Good. So a newborn child with ambiguous genitalia, one month later, has vomiting, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and acidosis. CAH, yep. And the most common cause, what enzyme? 21, good. 21 hydroxylase deficiency, definitive test. 17 OHP. 17 hydroxyprogesterone, um, and if you want, you can use that test with an ACTH bolus. Treatment? Well, with CAH, what do they not have? Well, they don't have that enzyme, but because they don't have that enzyme, they can't make cortisol or aldo. That's the root of their problem. So we give them cortisol and we give them fludrocortisone, which is like aldosterone. Okay. So, oh, one more thing about GU disorders that I don't have on here, but I've seen questions on, is uh, a baby with an anterior midline mass and uh, doesn't pee for like two days. Good. So posterior urethral valves are the most common cause of that. Anuria in the first couple days of life, and that big distended mass is the bladder that's distended. So we got to treat that how... Catheterize first, right, because the baby hasn't peed ever, and that could be a problem. So catheterize first, and then it will have to be surgery, surgically corrected. Okay, so infants of diabetic mothers, I'm sure you guys saw that more than you wanted to um, through your time here. And remember that there's a big difference between mothers who have diabetes, you know, type 1 diabetes or diabetes before they get pregnant, and then people who have gestational diabetes. So the associations with pre-existing diabetes, especially type 1, are... All of the you know, characteristic small left colon, caudal regression, um, all of the really bad developmental problems typically occur in people with pre-existing diabetes. Gestational diabetes, this opens up the door for problems like babies who are large for gestational age. And why do we care that a baby's large for gestational age? Yeah, because it increases the risk of birth trauma. So shoulder dystocia, um, problems with the brachial plexus injuries, and TTN, because of, there's an increased risk for C-section if the baby's big. Um, babies are often hypoglycemic, and poor K, does that happen? Yeah, so the fetal, uh, fetal baby, the baby, has fetal hyperinsulinemia because of maternal hyperglycemia. Good. And that's actually why they're big, because insulin is a growth factor. So it's fetal hyperinsulinemia that causes the baby to be LGA. And complications of hypoglycemia, see it in the newborn nursery. Or in life, yeah, seizures. So if the sugar's low, you're at risk for seizures. So anytime there's a child described in a vignette who's having seizures, got to check the sugar and got to check the calcium. So treatment of hypoglycemia. Good. Give them glucose. And if it's under 40, you can just feed them, feed them frequently with breast milk. If it's really low, under 20, that's when you start an IV and give glucose that way. Um, hypocalcemia, complications of that, we already said, right? Can also cause neonatal seizures. Polycythemia is another complication. And why does polycythemia happen? Ooh, it, it causes jaundice. You're ahead of me. So polycythemia happens because the baby's big, right? It's macrosomic, it's a big baby, needs more oxygen than it's getting from the placental um, circulation. So hypoxia is a trigger to those cells near the kidneys that make EPO. More EPO means more red blood cells. Um, and complications, 
if we have all these red blood cells floating around, the baby is prone to clot. Why jaundice? You already told me, right? More red blood cells to break down, not bread down. Um, and that increases these babies' risks for kernicterus. Uh, infants of diabetic mothers, even if they're not premature, have an increased risk of respiratory distress syndrome. Poor K. This is like a 10 bonus point question. <clears throat> Good, yeah, so insulin prevents that normal surge of cortisol. So typically, the surfactant is made and lungs are matured because of a big surge in cortisol right before birth. And insulin interferes with that. Hyperinsulinemia interferes with that. So um, even though the baby's not premature, you still want to check the LS ratio to make sure the lungs are mature prior to delivery. Good, 10 bonus points for you. If only, if I had that power, I'd be a very rich woman. It'd be great. Okay, so neonatal fever. Anytime a baby under one month old has a fever, is it a big deal? Yes, so it's always a big deal, even if the baby doesn't look sick. And in the clinical vignette, they won't. They won't look sick, but they'll have a temperature of 101. That's sustained. So in that case, you gotta order everything, right? I think Dr. Medellin makes a big deal about that in his lectures. So you gotta order everything, including an LP, to check for meningitis. And risk factors for neonatal sepsis? Choreo. So risk factors for choreo, like if the ruptures are prolonged for a long time, if the mom is GBS positive, um, any signs of infection in the mom that you see, if the mom's white blood cells are high or if the mom has a fever, all of that gives the baby a risk of neonatal sepsis. And most common bugs for neonatal sepsis? GBS, Listeria, and E. coli. Very good. So then how do you treat neonatal sepsis empirically, knowing that these are the most common bugs? Amoxicillin, or ampicillin, and gentamicin. So, and we want to make sure cultures are negative for 48 hours before stopping treatment. Okay. So torch infections, remember these. Macula papular rash on the palms and soles. That's the SIF, that's syphilis. Hydrocephalus, intracranial calcifications, and choreo, that's toxo. Cataracts, deafness, heart defects, extramedullary hematopoiesis, those are your blueberry muffin spots. Rubella, and there's really no good way to treat that, unfortunately. That's why we vaccinate, because it's such a devastating disease. So microcephaly, periventricular calcifications, deafness, thrombocytopenia, and petechiae, CMV. Limb hypoplasia, cutaneous scars, cataracts, chorioretinitis, and cortical atrophy. I missed this one on my Q bank, so I put it in here for y'all. Close. It's a herpes virus, congenital varicella. So the scars, I think, give it away. Think of it like the little scars from chickenpox. So that's congenital varicella syndrome. And this is kind of a tricky question. Uh, pay very special attention to when the mom contracts varicella. Because if the mom contracts varicella in the time period, five days before delivery to two days after delivery, baby gets immunoglobulin against varicella. All right, babies with gross stuff in their eye. If it's day of life one through three, the conjunctiva are red and tearing, what type of conjunctivitis is that? Chemical. Chemical. Gonorrhea looks much nastier. This is just kind of like some tears. They're clear tears and it's red. We don't really see this anymore because erythromycin doesn't cause it as much as the silver nitrate did, uh, but they still might write a test question about it. Uh, this baby right here, day of life three to five, this is some pretty nasty gonorrhea type conjunctivitis. So just like in STDs, purulent is gonorrhea, mucopurulent or mucoid is usually chlamydia. It's true for STDs, it's true for babies' eyes. So we particularly care about chlamydia conjunctivitis because it can lead to chlamydia pneumonia. Um, and that's probably the one you'll get a test question about um, just because it's got more long-term complications for the baby. Okay, so newborn baby, decreased tone, oblique palpebral fissures, semi-increased big tongue, white spots on the iris. Downs. 
and um, IQ and development. Yeah, so moderate MR and developmental delay. So if it's not caught uh, as a newborn, it'll be caught soon thereafter. Common medical complications is where a lot of questions lie. So heart defects that are common in Downs. Endocardial cushion defects, good. And GI complications, we talked about this already. Atresia. Hirschsprung's is also more common in Down syndrome. Um, endocrine abnormalities. Hypothyroidism, good. <laughs> Hypothyroidism. Musculoskeletal, I always forget this one, but it's a really uh, important thing for anesthesiologists to know, this musculoskeletal complication of Down syndrome. Atlanoaxial instability, because if the atlanoaxial joint is unstable, when they intubate the patient, it can cause cervical spine injury. So atlantoaxial instability uh, is more common in people with Down syndromes, and it's important to know before pre-op. So you'll want to do a C-spine film. Okay, neurologic. Yes, I didn't put that, but yes. This is later in life, like when they're 30 or 40. They get it earlier than most people. Alzheimer's. And that's because amyloid precursor protein is on chromosome 21. So people with Down syndrome have an extra dose of it. And cancer, ALL. They have an increased risk of ALL. Okay, so some more genetic stuff. Remember the rocker bottom feet, microcephaly, this is Edwards syndrome. Holoprosencephaly and cleft lip, cleft palate is Patau syndrome. 14-year-old um, girl with no secondary sex characteristics and high FSH. You'll see a Turner's question on your exam. Uh, associated anomalies with Turner's, this is important. Coarctation of the aorta, horseshoe kidney, less important because who cares. Um, coarctation of the aorta is probably the one they'll ask you about. And then treatment. Ooh, that's a good question. I d for, Klein for Kleinfelters, uh, they have an increased risk of gonadal malignancy. I don't think Turner's syndrome, they do have an increased risk of ovarian cancer. So what you do here is just give them estrogen. That way they undergo, pu you know, they look like they undergo puberty, they get their secondary sex characteristics. Um, speaking of Kleinfelters, there it is. So lanky boy, mild MR, gynecomastia, and hypogonadism. And they do have an increased risk of gonadal malignancy. Okay, so here's some random genetic things. Probably lower yields, but maybe if you hear me say them, it'll come to you when you're taking the test. So cafe au lait spots, seizures, big head, autosomal dominant trait, neurofibromatosis. This kiddo with the bird facies, mandibular hypoplasia, glossoproptosis, cleft palate. Pierre Robin sequence. Pierre Robin. Pierre Robin. Uh, broad square face, short stature, self injurious behavior. That's Smith McGinnis. I know. Lower yields, but at least now you've heard it. Um, hypotonia, hypogonadism, hyperphagia, skin picking, aggression. Eats all the time. Learned about it in neuro. Prater Willie. And then the cousin to that, the happy puppet people, Angelman. This cute little girl, elf in appearance, friendly, increased empathy. Williams, good. This cute little girl, we had one of these when I was on service uh, at Santa Rosa. Um, with the distinctive facies, hypertonia, self injurious behavior. Cornelia Delang. Cornelia Delang. Uh, this one you'll probably see. Microcephaly, smooth philtrum, thin upper lip, ADHD-like behavior, and it is the most common cause of mental retardation. Fetal alcohol syndrome. Good. The most common cause of mental retardation in boys. Fragile X. Autosomal dominant. Um, this is actually associated with advanced paternal age. White forelock and deafness. Wardenburg. Wardenburg syndrome. Remember the white forelock? I don't know if you learned about that second year or not. I vaguely remember it from second year. Okay, so a few slides on immune deficiencies, because there'll probably be one question on those. Um, if you see a kiddo that has multiple infections and no tonsils, no tonsils means B cell problem. So this is Bruton's A gamma globulinemia. 
In the labs, you'll see no B cells, and you'll see very low levels of immunoglobulins. Um, if you see low levels of immunoglobulins, but it's in an adolescent or a young adult, B cells are normal, but immunoglobulins are low. Think combined variable immune deficiency. This is something that's less severe and comes on later. Uh, but since it's a problem of B cell development and lymphoid tissue, they're at increased risk for cancer, for lymphoma. Uh, most common B cell deficit, oh, actually, you should know this. Most common B cell deficit overall. It's a deficiency of one type of immunoglobulin, IgA deficiency. And why is that a big deal in the hospital in general? Very good. They have a severe anaphylactic reaction if they're given blood with IgA in it. So that's why we care about it. Uh, if we've got a kiddo, oh, you're ba I bet you know this one too. Seizures, truncus arteriosus, micronathia. And no thymus. Oh. <laughs> to George. I couldn't give you no thymus, that would give it away. So truncus arteriosus is a heart defect that is pretty tightly linked with the George syndrome. The genetic defects, a problem on 22, infections in childhood, fungus, viruses, things that T cells usually take care of. Okay, so this kid's really screwed. No thymus and no tonsils. Severe lymphopenia. Skids, right? No thymus, problem with T cells. No tonsils, problem with B cells. Put them together, that's skid. Usually it's X-linked, but there is an autosomal recessive form. And the treatment, you've got to get them a bone marrow transplant. It's a pediatric emergency. So kids with recurrent swollen infected lymph nodes in the groin and lots and lots of abscesses keep getting admitted for MRSA abscesses. I didn't hear you. Very good. Chronic granulomatous disease. So they have a problem with catalase positive bugs. That's why they get uh, recurrent staph abscesses. And you diagnose it, there's an old school test that you probably remember from step one, nitrotetrazoleum blue. Uh, this is kind of a random one, 18-month-old baby with severe eczema, petechiae, and ear infections. So there's lots of IgE. Wiscott Aldrich, good, very good. And you often pick this up because of prolonged bleeding after circumcision, because thrombocytopenia is a characteristic. Good. And they've got high IgE and IgA. The other two types are usually low. Okay. So usually newborns lose 10% of their birth weight in one week. Poor K, does that happen? Yeah, so they pee. They pee. That's why they lose weight. And when should they regain birth weight? Two weeks. Double weight by? About six months. Triple weight by? one year. When do they increase their length by 50%? One year again, but they double their length. Four or five. Breast milk is good for babies. True or false? Good. What are contraindications to breastfeeding? There are very few. HIV, galactosemia and PKU, those are the fetal factors that are contraindications. HIV is a maternal factor. TB, drugs, um, chemo, specifically radioactive iodine. Mm -hmm. Yep, no lactase deficiency. That would be a problem also. Is hep C a contraindication to breastfeeding? No. That one is always tricky to remember. So, Also, if the mom's going to keep drinking, that's also a contraindication to breastfeeding. Okay, breast milk versus formula. What's the dominant protein in breast milk? Whey, not casein. And what's the dominant fatty acid in breast milk? Long chain or medium? 50-50. Long chain. So it's got more whey, more lactose, more long chain fatty acid. Actually has less iron than formula, but it's better absorbed if it's from breast milk. So it's kind of a wash that way. Okay, so abnormal disorders of growth. If we've got a 14-year-old boy... Um, has always been below the 5th percentile in height, and his parents are tall and say they were lay bloomers. Yeah, so this is constitutional growth delay. And they might ask you a bone age question here. And if you weren't in the endocrine clinic, this might be a little bit tricky for you. So in constitutional growth delay, the bone age is less than the real age, which means they've got room to catch up. 
Um, and there, you can tell the parents that they're likely to achieve normal adult height. So if we've got the same 14-year-old boy, but the parents are both very short. They're just short, familial short stature. And if we checked a bone age here, it would equal to the real age. So if you tell the parents, well, your child is you know, likely to be short when they grow up. So 14-year-old boy, 50th percentile in height, but 97th percentile in weight. Obesity. And why I put this on here is in obesity, the bone age is greater than the real age. And why is that? Not insulin, it's estrogen. Remember that fat cells make estrogen. Um, so high estrogen levels are going to mature the bone, close the apophyseal plate sooner, which leads to an advanced bone age. So some other causes of advanced bone age, precocious puberty will do it, um, like, a, like a neoplasm of the ovary or testis that makes androgens, congenital adrenal hyperplasia will, and hyperthyroidism. So what about our last kiddo, 14 years old, starts out in the 50th percentile and is trucking along, but in the past two years drops down to 10 and then 5. Are we worried about that? So we're worried about that. That's pathologic short stature. Anytime a kid falls off the growth curve, more than two um, growth curve percentiles, that's a problem. Um, and it could be a lack of growth hormone. It could be um, a problem like cr cr craniopharyngioma, um, hypothyroidism, or Turner's. But that wouldn't be a boy. Okay. Oh, so cute. I just made this slide so I could put the pictures on. So head is extended, arms and legs both flex. That's Moro, super cute. When you place your finger in the palm, the little hand, it's my favorite one. It's so cute. Okay, if you rub the cheek and the head turns to the side, that's rooting. Uh, if you stimulate the dorsum of the foot, it's the stepping or placing reflex. Um, when the neck is turned to one side, the opposite arm flexes and the ipsilateral arm extends. Fencing. Or tonic neck. Uh, when a fall is stimulated and arms are extended, that's parachute. So parachute and moro are kind of similar, but the parachute reflex, um, it's when you pick the baby up from its tummy. So like it's laying on its tummy, and you pick it up and it goes, ah! So that's parachute. And if you notice, that's the one that never goes away. The rest of those primitive reflexes are typically gone by six months. The parachute reflex persists. And these originate, because I love neurology, in the brainstem and vestibular nuclei. All right, so these are a pain. So let's practice. When can a baby roll over? Six months. Other things a baby can do at six months are sit with support, creep and crawl, and develop stranger anxiety. So that's normal at six months. When can a baby skip around and copy a triangle? So let's do some quick math. 60 divided by 12 is five years. So, um, and actually developmental milestones vary a little bit based on what book you read. Um, so some of these might be a little bit different than books y'all have read, but they should make it easy. For the, they should make it absolute. They won't put anything that's right on the line between one and two um, on your test. So when can a kiddo walk alone? A little bit earlier, or a little bit older than a year. 15 months is what was in my book. Um, walk upstairs with alternating feet. I had that for 30 months. Copy a cross and square. This one's pretty standard. Four years. You can also hop on one foot at four years and throw a ball overhead. Sits unsupported and develop your pincer grasp. Nine months. Walks downstairs and can copy a circle. Three years. Half of speech is comprehensible, and they can start to speak in two to three word sentences. Two years, right? Two years, half of speech is comprehensible. And when does a baby develop a social smile? Two months. Very good. So these questions can be tricky, and at this point in the game, you can kind of decide how much time you want to put into memorizing them for the one or two questions that will be there on your test. Um, the way they often write them is they'll give you a vignette for the baby where they are for speaking, gross motor, fine motor, such and such and such. And the answer choices will be advanced in one, 
but normal in one and deficient in one. So you really have to know all of the different milestones for that age group. So these questions can be hard. Okay, potty training. This is fun. So when should a baby be able to have urinary continence? It's pathologic after five. Most, most children have it before five, but it's pathologic after five years old. Um, medical causes to rule out, always do a UA first, because a UTI is the most common cause of um, enuresis. And treatment, remember you always use behavioral before drugs. Fecal continence, you should have that a little earlier. It's pathologic after four years old. Most common cause is constipation. Treatment, relieve the constipation. Doesn't sound like a fun job. And behavioral modification, um, stick them on the pot after they eat. That can help use the gastrocolic reflex to your advantage. Okay, some stuff on immunizations. The ones that are due at birth, these are probably good ones to know. Hep B, absolutely. And if, you, if they give you a scenario where the mom is HEP positive, they also get immunoglobulin. So the ones that occur at 2, 4, and 6, there are six of them. HEP B, rotavirus, DTaP, HIV, PCV, and IPV. Um, and then the ones that start at six months and then yearly, the flu vaccine. Contraindications to the flu vaccine? Egg allergy, very good. Do it 12 months and not before, because they're live vaccines. Varicella, good. And hep A, if, uh, if indicated. The live vaccines can't be given to kids under 12 months. And contraindications to MMR, I think this was in pretest, and I thought it was a dirty question, um, but one of the components of MMR is neomycin or streptomycin. It's just a component in the vaccine, so if the kid's allergic to it, you can't give them MMR. Um, do before two, get some more DTaP, more Hep A, and do before kindergarten, you finish up the rest of the vaccines you started in childhood. Do at age 12 before middle school, booster shots for Tdap, and then um, meningitis is now is now recommended for kids before they go to school. Okay, so some heart stuff. So benign murmurs, the two that you need to know are Stills murmur and the venous hum. So know about those, um, and then know that anything that occurs in diastole or anything that's greater than two out of six is pathologic, always. So if you find a pathologic murmur, the best first test, this is an easy question, you always do an echo. So let's look at this kid. The newborn is cyanotic at birth, and oxygen does not improve the cyanosis. What was that? So transposition, good. And transposition of the great arteries, what does that associate with? What is that associated with? Invincive diabetic mothers. It's more common in invincive diabetic mothers. The associated murmur of TGA? Trick question, no murmur. So this is the one uh, heart defect that doesn't have a murmur. And immediate treatment right away or the kid is screwed, keep the ductus arteriosus patent. So we need to give prostaglandins. So what about this kid? That's a pretty nice chest x-ray. Cyanotic and um, starts breathing fast with, when playing and does the squat. So that's a tet spell in Tetralogy of Fallot. So I'm sure you know the four components of Tetralogy of Fallot. Make sure you remember them on Friday. Associated murmur with Tetralogy of Fallot. So it's got a VSD in it, right? VSD, or intraventricular septal defect, is one of the components. So you'll have um, the systolic ejection murmur of VSD. And treatment, immediately you give them O2 and put their knees to their chest to help with circulation and oxygenation, but eventually they're going to need surgical correction. Okay, so a lady is bipolar, and she gives birth to a baby with a holosystolic murmur that's worse, worse on inspiration. So first of all, bipolar, what might she be taking that's bad for a baby's heart? Lithium, right? Lithium can cause what type of anomaly? Abstains. And what does it mean, murmur worse on inspiration? What does that tell you about the heart defect? Right side, good. Any murmur that's worse with inspiration is a right-sided murmur. 
That's a good buzzword to remember. And the associated, associated arrhythmia that can cause problems for these children later, I didn't know this, I got a question wrong uh, on my QBank. Wolf Parkinson White is associated with Epstein's anomaly. Okay, so cyanosis at birth, holosystolic murmur, and depends on a VSD or ASD for life. The EKG shows left ventricular hypertrophy. Tricuspid atresia here. So the left ventricular hypertrophy is really the buzzword here. Because the tricuspid valve is atretic, the blood is going to go through a VSD or ASD to the left side of the heart. So that's what gives the left ventricular hypertrophy for tricuspid atresia. That's, I think, the best buzzword for it. Uh, the heart defect that's associated with the George syndrome, I think I said it before. Truncus arteriosus, good. And the number one congenital heart lesion. VSD, very good. The characteristic murmur is harsh and holosystolic, um, and you can hear it best at the left lower sternal border. So what should we do if we hear a VSD and it's only two out of six and the kid's two months old? Wait it out. Yeah, the baby's not symptomatic. There's no pulmonary hypertension. There's no issues. Wait and continue to monitor. If it's not closed by two years, consider um, surgical correction. The gold standard test for any murmur. Very good. And when do we do surgery? So, um, FFT, FTT. Failure to thrive, very good. Failure to thrive, so that's an indication for surgery. Um, you do surgery earlier if the baby develops pulmonary hypertension. Otherwise, wait till the baby's two. And is louder better or worse in terms for VSDs? Louder is better, right? Because blowing stuff through a small hole is going to make more noise. A bigger defect is going to make less noise, and that has a worse prognosis. Okay, so if you're examining a child and hear a loud S1 with fixed and split S2. ASD, very good. Typically they present older um, and they can't keep up in PE class. Uh, most common defect in Down syndrome baby, fixed and split S2 plus a systolic ejection murmur. Endocardial cushion defect. So it's kind of a combination between an ASD murmur and a VSD murmur, because the endocardial cushions right, are right in the middle. So you remember this one, continuous machine-like murmur with bounding pulses. Oops, PDA, very good. And associations here are with prematurity um, and also congenital rubella syndrome. That's the torch infection that's most likely to have a, a PDA. Treatment for a PDA? endomethacin. Good. If endomethacin doesn't work, we go to surgery. Um, oh, we already talked about this. The most common defect in a Turner's baby is coarctation, and this chest x-ray shows what's called the uh, figure of three, or the number three sign. Do you see the red, the yellow, blue, and green arrow? It's supposed to be kind of like a three. Um, and then the red arrows are pointing to rib notching because of the intercostal arteries. Okay, so some other cardiac diseases uh, not related to brand new babies. 15-year-old athlete complains of occasional palpitations, angina, and dizziness. Last week he fainted during the first inning of his baseball game. What are we worried about here? Hokum, right? Hyper hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Good. And what does the murmur sound like? Is it systolic or diastolic? It's systolic. It's a systolic ejection murmur. If you remember from cardiology in second year, it sounds just like um, aortic stenosis, except it is uh, quieter when the, baby, or when the person squats and louder when the person stands. Because these murmurs get worse with a decrease in preload. That's what makes them different from aortic stenosis. So how do we treat hypertrophic uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy? So they can't play sports, right? So we cannot clear them for their sports physical. Uh, medical management, you can use beta blockers, um, but if they continue to be sim symptomatic, 
you have to go correct the obstructive um, lesion in the heart. So you can actually inject ethanol on it, and that'll kind of dissolve the uh, obstructive lesion or do surgery and cut it out. So restrictions, no sports for these kids. So another cardiac disease, seven-year-old girl presents with vague chest pain, pain in several different joints. She's got a rash. Her ESR is up. Her EKG shows prolongation of the PR interval. It is rheumatic fever. It is. So it's heart stuff plus joint stuff plus rash is rheumatic fever. And the treatment here, penicillin, because it's caused by strep. Complications can develop mitral stenosis later in life. Okay, just a couple respiratory diseases. Cystic fibrosis is a big one. Signs at birth, we talked about one already. Meconium ileus um, and rectal prolapse later on become chronic diarrhea. But meconium ileus is the sign at birth. Uh, and in early childhood, you suspect it any time a baby has failure to thrive. And then all of those signs of malabsorptive diarrhea, bulky stools, really foul-smelling stools, all of those should signal you to do a sweat chloride test. So typically cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive, mutation on chromosome 7. Diagnose it with a sweat test. Uh, and for treatment, kind of treat symptomatically. So for the thick secretions that can cause respiratory problems, a mucolytic is helpful. For the pneumonia, got to give them antibiotics. And remember that the most common bug um, is pseudomonas. So we have to pick a, an antibiotic that will cover it. For pancreatic insufficiency, we got to replace the enzymes. And um, for electrolyte loss through the skin, you have to be really careful because these kids, if they're playing sports or if they're exercising outside, they lose a lot more electrolytes through their skin and can become hypovolemic. Okay, for asthma. So if your kid with asthma has symptoms twice a week, but the PFTs are normal, what type of asthma do they have? It's mild, right? Mild and intermittent. And how do we treat mild intermittent asthma? Just a rescue. Yeah, just albuterol. That's all they need. Um, if a patient has symptoms four times a week plus a night cough, but the PFTs are still normal, what type of asthma? Now it's mild persistent. Mild persistent. And what we add here in treatment is an inhaled corticosteroid. So what makes them mild is the PFTs are normal. So the difference is intermittent versus persistent. And if it's persistent, you add a corticosteroid to um, help with inflammation. So a patient has symptoms daily, night cough twice a week, and the FEV1 is low, between 60 and 80%. Now it's moderate, yep. And what do we add to the treatment regimen? So they're on an inhaled corticosteroid. We'll save the oral steroids for severe. So what we add here is a long-acting beta agonist like salmeterol. So for super bad asthma, daily symptoms, um, night cough all the time, and FEV1 is in the pooper, now we add oral, cortic oral corticosteroids or a leukotriene modifying agent. Okay, so be able to pick out an asthma exacerbation if they give you one in a clinical vignette. And please remember that if the PCO2 becomes normal, is that a bad sign or a good sign? What would you expect the PCO2 to be in a kid who's having an asthma attack? PCO2. They're hyperventilating, right? So they're trying to get enough oxygen, so they're breathing real fast. So it should be low. It should be low. If it starts to come up and it starts to become normal, that's a sign of respiratory muscle fatigue and actually an indication for intubation. So um, don't be tricked by that. If the PCO2 is low and becomes normal, don't say, oh, that's great, my patient's getting better, it's now normal. It's actually a sign of respiratory, uh, respiratory muscle fatigue. Okay, so diabetes. We've got a 12-year-old girl who presents with a two-day history of vomiting. For the last four weeks, she's noticed weight loss, polyphagia, poly polydipsia, and polyuria. So, sounds like diabetes, right? Here are her electrolytes. The sodium is 130. Chloride is 90, 
bicarb is 15, and glucose is 436. What's the next best step? If she has diabetes, what else does she have based on those electrolytes? What's her anion gap? Should be high, right? 130 minus 90 is what? Uh, 40 minus 15 is high. So it's high. So she's got an a anion gap. Um, and I heard insulin. We've got to start insulin in addition to IV fluids. And we keep watching the blood glucose. Really, anion gap is the best lab test to monitor, to monitor improvement in diabetes. Um, and remember to start potassium. Why? Why do we need to add potassium to the IV fluids? What does insulin do to potassium? It brings it into the cell. So when we start insulin therapy, we need to add potassium to the IV fluids, otherwise the patient could get hypokalemic. So, good. Pathophysiology of diabetes, um, if it's type 1 in these kiddos, remember it's a destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas, um, autoantibodies that cause that. And long-term treatment, we need to give them insulin. So diagnostic criteria for diabetes, we see it more with type 2. So fasting over 126 plus symptoms. Yep, uh, any glucose over 200 with symptoms. And we usually do this with the pregnant ladies, a glucose challenge test. So if we do a two-hour oral glucose challenge test with 75 grams of glucose, if it's over 200, then that's also diagnostic. Good. All right. Any questions so far before we move into the wonderful world of rashes? No. Okay. So let's look at some rashes. Got a two-year-old kiddo. The fever is 105. Three days later, there's a pink maculopapular rash on the trunk, arms, and legs. And that little cartoon baby has it. So super high fever, then a rash later. Roseola, good. Human herpes virus 6. Um, so, oh, that girl's so cute. Little slap cheek rash action going on in my second patient. What does she have? What? It's a bad kid. She got smacked in the face. Smacked in the face by parvovirus. So she's got parvovirus B19, and when do, we, when do we really care about parvovirus B19? When is it really bad? Sickle cell kids, super bad for sickle cell kids, also for pregos, right? Pregnant ladies, if they get this, their baby can develop hydrops fatalis uh, and die. So bad for sickle cell kids because it can cause an aplastic crisis, bad for pregnant women. So our third rash is a fine maculopapular rash that desquamates. It begins on the chest, spreads to the neck, trunk, and extremities with a strawberry tongue. Scarlet fever. And how do we treat it? Penicillin. Very good. And we treat penicillin, remember, to prevent rheumatic fever, but it does nothing against um, glomerular nephritis, post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Okay, so this poor kid has a cough, runny nose, fever, and then gets a rash that begins behind the ears and goes down the body. Um, and there are also gray spots on the buccal mucosa. Measles. So those are coplic spots, the gray ones. And how do we treat it? Vitamin A. Very good. Vitamin A in supportive care. So sore throat, joint pain, fever, pinpoint rash on the face that spreads down, and rose spots on the palate. That's rubella. So that's rubella. The joint pain and sore throat with the rash make it rubella. Um, I've never, sometimes they talk about the rose spots, usually not. And complications of rubella, why we care about this? Pregnant ladies, again, because of congenital rubella syndrome. So if we got a little baby with vesicles in the mouth, on the palms and soles, and a rash on the butt. It's not herpes, Coxsackie, that's hand, foot, and mouth disease. 
Coxsackie virus. Very good. <laughs> Looks like herpes, doesn't it? Okay, and then our last kid, 16-year-old with swollen parotid glands, fever, and headache. That's the mumps. And complications, especially if it's a boy? Sterility, yeah. Orchitis leading to sterility. Very good. Okay, check out that rash. You don't even have to read it. What is it? What? Lyme, good, Lyme disease. And complications of Lyme disease? This can get ugly. So Bell's palsy can cause cardiac problems. It can cause meningitis. So those are problems. How do we treat it? What? Doxy. Uh, what if the kid is six, like he is in my case? Nope. Nope. That's Rocky Mountain spotted fever that always gets doxy no matter what. For Lyme disease, if they're under eight, you give them amoxicillin. So amoxicillin if they're under eight. Doxy if they're over eight. Um, and actually, if they have meningitis, you have to give them IV ceftriaxone because doxy won't penetrate the CSF. But I'll get to that later. Okay, so now we've got a six-year-old kid. He just went to coastal North Carolina, like me, uh, and went camping. He had a fever, myalgia, and abdominal pain. It's a rickettsia. So that's Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Complications of this, um, it can actually infect the vessels and cause gangrene. And the treatment here is always doxy. Doxy, doxy, doxy. Doesn't matter if he's six, doesn't matter if he's two. There's no other antibiotic that's effective against it. So this little kiddo on his wrist has these really itchy things that he scratches all the time. Scabies. So gross. And how do we treat it? Sulfur? We can use sulfur ointment if the kid is very young, like under three months or something like that. Um, otherwise, permethrin. And everybody gets permethrin, right? Permethrin for everybody in the house because those things are contagious. Um, if a kid has a honey-colored crusted plaque on the face, impetigo should be all the buzzwords you need. Um, and you treat impetigo with topical mucoprosin. If we have inflamed conjunctiva and multiple blisters, that's Nikolsky's positive. Scalded skin syndrome. What's Nikolsky's sign? Yeah, if you run your finger against the skin, the epidermis separates and comes off. So... Good, and we treat that with IV antibiotics because it's serious. Okay, so meningitis, most common bugs in life for everybody. Strep pneumo, strep pneumo. H flu and Neisseria meningitidis are runners up. Um, in the super young or immune suppressed, like neonates maybe, group B strep. Um, listeria is what I was going for because that's also immune suppressed people are susceptible. In people who've had brain surgery and instrumentation, mm, staph, usually staph aureus. If they're having brain surgery with you know instruments going in the brain, it increases risk of staph. And then other random ones, TB can cause meningitis and also Lyme disease. And remember, if Lyme disease causes meningitis, doxy won't work. You've got to use ceftriaxone IV. So the best first step, if you suspect meningitis, hmm? tap them. Should we do anything before we tap them? Yeah, so I think that's going to be the right answer on your test. You want to either they have to tell you something in the question stem that says, you know, they don't have a swollen optic disc or you don't suspect increased intracranial pressure. Um, uh, otherwise, you should check a CT to make sure that they don't have um, increased pressure. So, but actually, we want to start the antibiotics first, real quick, if the lumbar puncture is going to be delayed. Then we look for increased ICP. Then we do an LP and gram stain. So, um, for a kid who has bacterial meningitis, like with Neisseria meningitidis, what should we give his dorm roommate? Or a famfin. So random, right? It's a TB drug, but it's prophylaxis for people who may have been exposed to Neisseria meningitidis. Okay, 
So all kids get ear infections, therefore there will be an ear infection question on your exam. So if a kid has a fever to 102, is tugging on his right ear, and tympanic membrane is red and bulging, what's the most sensitive diagnostic test to confirm? Look at it. What are you looking for? Membrane. Mobility is technically the most sensitive test. So we don't do this because it hurts the kids, right, when you blow ear, uh, air in their ear to see if the membrane moves. But this is the most sensitive diagnostic test. What I told you in the vignette is that the membrane is red and bulging. Is that good enough? It's not, because that happens when kids are crying. If a kid is crying and real worked up and throwing a tantrum, the membrane will be red and bulging. So you want to see either retraction of the tympanic membrane or lack of mobility on insufflation. Risk factors here, um, usually it's something about daycare. Either they've got a bunch of siblings at home or they go to daycare and they're around lots of other kids. That's the most important risk factor. Treatment for otitis media? Moxicillin. Very good. Ta does it still taste like bubble gum? I didn't do outpatient when I was on peds. Do they still give that pink stuff that they drink? Yeah. Stuff was delicious. Okay, complications of ear infections. Why do we treat it? Did you say death? death? Death, yes, death. So uh, effusions can lead to hearing problems. So um, that's where effusion tubes come into play um, if the effusions are bilateral or if they persist. <laughs> All right, so other ear problems. How about this 12-year-old kiddo? Pain behind his ear and thick, nasty stuff coming out of the ear. That's otitis externa, as opposed to media. And the treatment here? What's the most likely bug in otitis externa? Pseudomonas. So we want to treat with something that covers it, like Cipro. So topical ciprofloxacin is the best drug for that. Complications here, um, rarely it progresses to malignant external otitis, and it can invade the temporal bone, brain abscess, all that kind of badness. Okay, so for sore throats, um, if you see a seven-year-old kid with exudative pharyngitis and tender cervical lymph nodes and a fever to 102, what tests do you want to do first? Rapid strep. And what if the rapid strep is negative? Then we need a culture. Very good, especially if we have high clinical suspicion like with this kiddo. And how do we treat strep? Penicillin or erythromycin. So again, why do we treat strep? To prevent rheumatic fever. Good. That's why we treat it. It's not really a big deal. Penicillin only shortens the sickness by maybe one or two days, but it does prevent or decrease the risk of developing rheumatic fever. So if this same kiddo maybe didn't get treatment and then comes to you a few days later with a muffled voice and strider and won't turn the head, what complication has he developed? Yes, yeah, so retropharyngeal abscess. So it prevents, it's retropharyngeal um, starting to affect the voice and prevents turning of the head. Treat here, you've got to aspirate it. You've got to IND the abscess, just like an abscess anywhere, and treat with strong antibiotics. Complications here, um, you could get mediastinitis, because I don't know if you remember from uh, anatomy way back in the day, the retropharyngeal space communicates with the mediastinum. So an abscess there could cause uh, inflammation and infection in the mediastinum. So this is another complication of strep throat, a hot potato voice. And when you look in the throat, the uvula is deviated. And there's a bulge there. So it's a different type of abscess. Peritonsillar. So retropharyngeal is more external, communicates with the mediastinum. Peritonsillar causes a deviation of the uvula. So treatment here is the same. We've got to IND it. It's an abscess. And treat it with some strong antibiotics. Indications for tonsillectomy is if the strep is recurrent. There's more than five episodes a year um, for two years or more than three episodes a year for three. Okay, so now we've got an older kid with a sore throat who also has fever, fatigue, adenopathy, splenomegaly, mono. 
So what happens if you give this kid ampicillin or amoxicillin? Rash. How do we diagnose mono? Monospot. Uh, old school, they might show you those really weird lymphocytes. Remember, they look all weird and big and scary. Those are just atypical lymphocytes for mono. Um, treatment? Yeah, not a lot to do. Just rest. What precautions do you need to give this kid, though? Yeah, no contact sports until the splenomegaly is gone. So there's not really a time limit on it. It's just until the splenomegaly resolves. Okay. So, actually, this picture right here was on my step two. I felt like I was cheating. It's like, hey, I put that in my PowerPoint. It was on step two. So what is that? Steeple sign, right? So that's steeple sign for croup. The most common bug causing croup, or virus, I guess. Parainfluenza. And the x-ray buzzword we got is the steeple sign. Treatment for croup. Give them something to breathe in. Racemic epi, good. Racemic epi, steroids are second line. Okay, so what about this scary CT right here? Fever to 104, drooling, intercostal retractions, tripod position, all sounds very scary stuff. What is this? Epiglottitis. And the most common bug? What if the kid is vaccinated? Strep pyogenes, strep pneumo, or staph, if the kid is immunized, but if they tell you it's like an immigrant child or a child whose parents are hippies and don't immunize them, um, then it would be H flu type B. X-ray buzzword here, thumb sign. Next best step. Where is the thumb sign on that? It's supposed to be the arrow. It's kind of, I think it's supposed to look like your thumb is pushing it. I'm not sure. Sorry. Radiology is a little beyond me. What's the next best step for epiglottitis? This is important. Do not pass go. Do not do anything until you... Yeah, and you want to intubate in the OR because any manipulation of that epiglottis can cause spasm and loss of airway and death. So don't try to intubate the patient in the ER. Don't try to do it in the office. Go to the OR, have an anesthesiologist on hand, and intubate the patient in the OR. And treatment here... To treat the bug, right? It's got to treat the bug. So, racemic epi won't cut it here. We have to treat with antibiotics. Okay, so some pneumonias. This kiddo has a cough, productive of yellow green sputum, runny nose, temperature it's a little bit high, 100.8, and the lung exam really doesn't reveal anything normal, just some coarse ronchi. So, what does this kid have? I'll tell you it's a misnomer that I put it on the pneumonia slide. Do we have enough to diagnose pneumonia? We don't. And the kid has a runny nose, right? It's acute bronchitis. So acute bronchitis is kind of funky sputum, maybe a low-grade fever, but there's no abnormal signs on the lung exam. So unless you hear something abnormal like crackles or egophony or any of those great things you were taught to look for, you don't do a chest x-ray. What you do is treat with supportive care. If there were any abnormal signs on the lung exam, that's when you would do a chest x-ray and start treatment for pneumonia. So uh, because this is so important in the outpatient setting, there's often a question where you have to determine, is this really pneumonia or is this just a bad bronchitis? So um, if, the sim if the kid had similar symptoms but had decreased breath sounds on one side, crackles, high white blood cell, yada, 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 now we need a chest x-ray. Uh, most common cause of pneumonia in little bitty babies? The same things that cause other things in little bitty babies, right? Group B strep, E. coli, and listeria. Um, in slightly older babies, one month to three months old. Chlamydia shows up here. RSV is another big cause that you probably see um, in the hospitals. Parainfluenza and then strep pneumo. Uh, some specific physical findings of chlamydia pneumonia. Did I tell you this already? It's a staccato cough. If you hear staccato cough or read staccato cough in a vignette, think about chlamydia pneumonia. And also eosinophilia. Um, in kids between four months and five years old, 
viral is the most common cause of pneumonia. That's different than any other age group. And then kids that are older than five um, are just like adolescents or young adults, mycoplasma and then strep pneumo. Okay, so more kids with coughs. This is an infant with a runny nose, wheezy cough, temperature of 101.5, and respiratory rate of 60. It's got retractions and a pretty low pulse ox. So what does this kid probably have? Yeah, RSV bronchiolitis. You answered both questions. So chest x-ray findings in RSV. Typically, you see a little bit of atelectasis, but no consolidation and hyperinflation. Treatment. Have you guys seen kids with RSV? It's not really RSV season right now. Have you seen them on the wards? So what's the treatment? So this kid would meet criteria for hospitalization. Not every kid with, with bronchiolitis needs to be hospitalized, but this child is in respiratory distress, um, and we treat him with NEBS. It's important to note that steroids don't help in bronchiolitis. And there is an RSV vaccine, but very few children qualify for it. It's really only if you're premature, have congenital heart disease, lung disease like CF, um, or immune disease like those ones we talked about on the previous slide. So our second kid is a nine-month-old infant, severe coughing spells, loud inspiratory whoop, and vomiting afterwards, post-tussive vomiting. Um, two weeks ago, had a runny nose and dry cough. Pertussis. So whooping cough, Bordetella pertussis. What will we see in the lab? There's high lymphocytes, which is weird because it's a bacteria, but Bordetella pertussis causes lymphocytosis. And how do we treat it? Erythromycin. And what do the family members get in the kids in her daycare? The same thing. So this is an extremely, extremely contagious disease where close contacts of the patient are treated with the same regimen as the patient herself. Okay, so UTI. Um, these are kind of hard to catch in a newborn because they can't tell you that it burns when they pee, uh, but they can be fussy and they can maybe not want to drink as much and get dehydrated. Um, but remember that any febrile UTI, especially in children or in anybody, a febrile UTI is pyelonephritis. So uh, before age one, boys are more likely to get it. Um, but afterwards, women, because of their anatomic makeup, are more likely to get UTIs. Um, for boys and girls, what's an anatomic risk factor? Vesicourethral reflux. And if you diagnose that in a child, they need antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent UTIs from developing. Uh, how do we diagnose them? Duh. Look at the pee, right? So you have to get a urinalysis. And uh, remember that in babies, there's no such thing as a clean catch. They can't do it physically. So you have to catheterize them to get a clean catch sample to do the UA. You need to get an ultrasound um, anytime there's a febrile UTI or a pyelonephritis. And you do the ultrasound if you suspect an abscess or hydronephrosis. So we treat it with trimsulfa or nitrofurotoin, similar in adults. Uh, for pylo, we need something stronger. They need IV antibiotics for at least two weeks. Follow-up for a kid with UTI. What special study do we need to do? Well, we need to make sure that they don't... Um, that's not what I was expecting. We need to make sure that they, the antibiotics works and that the UTI resolves. When do we need to do a VCUG? That's what I was getting at. Hmm? Sure. So it could look for posterior urethral valves, like we talked about in the neonates. Um, what? So if there's more than one UTI, any time. Um, but actually, in boys, you get a VCUG after their first UTI. You also get a VCUG after the first UTI in very young females under the age of five. And then females old, older than five, you get the VCUG after the second one. And this is kind of random. I don't think it's as important for you guys. Um, the technetium labeled DMSA scan is very sensitive for looking for renal scarring. So pyelonephritis can have a complication of renal scarring, and this particular test is the best test for that. Don't know how important that is. Okay, bone and joint stuff. Kid with a limp. You've studied it. You've seen it. 
You'll see it on your test. So what's the most common cause overall of a limping child? Hmm? Yeah, just some kind of trauma. Some type of trauma or sprain or strain or break, just trauma. Not any of the random causes that you probably spent time studying. So if we have a little baby with asymmetric gluteal folds on exam, what are we thinking? Hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia. And what are risk factors for that? Girls or boys? Firstborn or lastborn? Big or small? Breach, yeah. Okay, so not big or small. Breach or normal. So firstborn females um, in the breach position, also with a positive family history. Treatment and diagnosis. Uh, remember, that's why you do all those little maneuvers with the kiddos to diagnose them. Um, if you think you hear a click or a clunk, do an ultrasound of the hip to make sure. And there's a special harness that's used in treatment. Uh, if we have a five-year-old little boy with a painless limp, now with pain in his thigh. Yes. Can never, I never did get a consensus on how to pronounce this. How do you guys pronounce this? Leg calve perthy disease. So avascular necrosis, so that's that. Little kid with a painless limp. How about a little kid after a cold with a limp and an effusion in the hip? They did x-rays of the hip, they're normal. ESR is high, temperature's really not that high, and the white blood cells aren't that high. Transient synovitis, so what's the next best step? Yeah, just kind of conservative treatment. Bed rest for a week and NSAIDs. Okay, so got a 14-year-old lanky male with nagging knee pain, but on physical exam, it's his hip that has decreased range of motion. Skiffy. I thought that was only in fat kids, no? No, it's not. So obese, obese adolescents are usually what the classic presentation is, but it can also happen after a growth spurt. So think of it either in overweight adolescents or in tall, lanky, post-growth spurt adolescents. And treatment here? This one needs surgery, because um, osteonecrosis is a complication if it isn't surgically corrected. And this last one, 14-year-old basketball player, knee pain and swelling of the tibia tubercle. Osgood Schlatter, it's an overuse injury typically like in basketball players or volleyball players, people that do a lot of jumping. Okay, so here's one. I don't know if you'll see this one. I had a couple questions in my QBank about it. 12-year-old female with a two-week history of daily fevers to 102 and a salmon-colored evanescent rash on the trunk, shoulders, and thighs. Left knee and right knee are swollen. So fevers joint swelling, random rash. Joint swelling, joint swelling. JRA, yes. So this is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Good prognostic factors are actually ANA positivity. Bad prognostic factors are if RF is positive. Um, treatment here is just like adult RA. First you try NSAIDs, if those don't work, you go to more um, or less benign drugs like methotrexate, and last you would use steroids. So this kid you will see on your shelf, two-year-old female with a two-week history of daily fevers to 102 and a desquamating rash on the perineum, has swollen hands and feet, conjunctivitis, and a unilateral swollen cervical lymph node. Have you seen this one enough? Yes. What is it? Kawasaki's. Such a random disease, but it'll be on your shelf. It's on every test. I don't know why. So other lab findings you might see, remember thrombocytosis is present in Kawasaki syndrome, especially in the second and third week. Um, and there's sterile pyuria, which is kind of confusing in diagnosis. It kind of makes you think um, a UTI, but it's just the inflammation. And the best first test, what is the best first test once you suspect Kawasaki's? What's going what's gonna to kill you in Kawasaki's? So we need an echo and an EKG, because that's what's going to kill you. Treatment? Aspirin and IVIG. Good. So this is one of the indications, the few indications, to give a pediatric patient aspirin. And the most serious sequelae, what are we scared of? 
Very good. Very good. Glad you guys know that one. That one will be on there. Okay, so some cancerous bone pain. Um, the two main tumors you need to know are what? What are the two main bone tumors for children? Osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. So which is which here? Onion skinning is Ewing's. Ew, an onion. Ewing sarcoma. So onion skinning on x-ray, think Ewing sarcoma. And then sunburst and Codman's triangle is osteogenic sarcoma. So this bottom one here, more diffuse bone pain in a kiddo that also has petechiae, pallor, and increased infections. Leukemia. In children, leukemia often presents with bone pain. It's a little more diffuse, um, but due to the cancer's involvement in the marrow, it can cause bone pain as well. Okay, so some hemonc stuff. Yikes. So if we have an African-American or Mediterranean child with sickle cell disease, and they come in with swollen, painful hands and feet. What's that? It's a pain crisis, um, and the technical name of if it's for the hands and feet is dactylitis. And it's, it occurs because of occlusion of the little arteries feeding the small bones of the hands and feet. If they have excruciating pain in the extremities with ulcers or hip pain, those are full-blown pain crises. And again, it's due to sickling and then causing thrombosis. Uh, what if there's point tenderness on the femur, fever, and malaise? And what's the most common bug? Good. So osteomyelitis, the most common bug in sickle cell kids is salmonella. Um, so what are these little thingies on blood smear? Does it bring back memories of pathology? Do you see some sickle cells? What's that purple cell with the big dot in it? It's a nucleated red blood cell. And what's that little purple dot in the pink cell? It's a Howell Jolly body. So what do we know has happened to our patient with a Howell Jolly body? Autosplenectomy. Good. Okay, so if our kid with sickle cell has a sudden drop in hematocrit with decreased reticulocytes, what are we worried about? A plastic crisis. If we have no reticulocytes, that means there's a problem with from the very bottom of, progen of uh, progenitors for red blood cells. So a plastic crisis, usually caused by parvovirus B19. Uh, recurrent right upper quadrant pain after meals. Mm-hmm. Cholecystitis caused by what kind of gallstones? Pigment gallstones, good. Pigment gallstones, and you do a cholecystectomy just like for a normal patient. Uh, respiratory distress, and they need an emergent tonsillectomy? Not yet, not acute chest syndrome yet. Um, Waldire ring hyperplasia. I got a question, I think in pretest, where they asked the two most common operations necessary for sickle cell patients, and it's cholecystectomy because of the gallstone, pigment gallstones, and a tonsillectomy, because patients with sickle cell have uh, hyperplasia of their lymphoid tissue that can cause respiratory problems. So proteinuria and increased creatinine with recurrent UTIs. This is just kidney infarcts. So there are problems with the sickle cells occluding blood vessels everywhere, including the kidneys. Most common cause of sepsis, strep pneumo. Not salmonella, but salmonella will be an answer choice. Strep pneumo is the right one. Um, presents with fever, cough, chest pain, chills, and shortness of breath. Here's your acute chest syndrome. So this is the most common cause of death in sickle cell patients. Treatment. Got to get rid of the sickle cells with an exchange transfusion. Acute confusion and focal neurologic deficits. Stroke. How do we treat it? Good. A wrong answer choice will be TPA. Do not pick it. Pick exchange transfusion. Because what's the problem, right? It's the sickle cells causing the occlusion. Uh, assessing risk for stroke? Yeah. Transcranial Doppler. Vaccination and prophylaxis for patients with sickle cell? Hydroxyurea can be used to treat. That increases the amount of fetal hemoglobin. 
What three vaccinations do sickle cell patients need? Good. H, H flu, strep pneumo, and Neisseria. And also um, penicillin prophylaxis until they're six. Okay, so if our sickle cell patient presents with fatigue and megaloblastic anemia, what might cause a megaloblastic anemia? Folate deficiency. And patients with sickle cell are more prone to folate deficiency because they have so much more red blood cell turnover. So they use more of it, and they're more prone to deficiency if it's not um, supplemented. Treatment, we already said, hydroxyurea to increase the hemoglobin, the fetal hemoglobin. Okay, so when is anemia not a big deal in children? During, oh, so during menstruation in adolescent females. Okay, you still treat them with iron. Yeah, so there's a physiologic anemia um, in the first few months of life, just because the fetal red blood cells are dying off quicker than the adult ones can be made. So, or not adult, but non-fetal ones can be made. Um, so what if we have an 18-month-old kid, he's a very picky eater, and drinks lots of cow's milk? What type of anemia is common in this type of child? Iron deficiency, and that goes, right, with the low h and it's microcytic, there's low ferritin and high TIBC. All of those support an iron deficiency anemia picture. What about an 18-month-old kiddo? Eats a varied diet, but the mom is Italian. Yeah, and what, um, what picture on the iron panel points you towards thalassemia? Check out the MCV. It's super low. Thalassemia has a super low, it's super microcytic. So even more microcytic than plain old um, iron deficiency. We have a kid that is irritable, has glossitis and failure to thrive, picky eater, and drinks lots of goat's milk. Delicious. Oh, not an infection. Check out the smear. Folate deficiency. Folate deficiency. Um, it's common in children who drink formula based on goat's milk. I saw a lot of um, clinical vignettes written that way. So a primary goat's milk diet predisposes you to folate deficiency. Okay. So four-month-old baby, normal platelets, white blood cells, but the hemoglobin is four. There's increased red blood cell ADA and low reticulocytes, and the kid has triphalangeal thumbs. These are some random childhood anemias. I think I hear it. Black fan diamond. Good. And we treat this with corticosteroids and eventually transfusions and stem cell transplants. So... Um, Triphalangeal thumbs. So what about not triphalangeal thumbs, but a kid with profound anemia and no thumbs? No thumbs. No thumbs and no radius. Fanconi. Good. That's Fanconi's anemia. So both of these have to do with thumbs. That's how I remembered it. Blackfin diamond is triphalangeal thumbs, um, and Fanconi's is absent thumbs and radii. Diagnose it uh, by looking at the bone marrow, because it's a severe profound anemia. Treat it with the same thing, corticosteroids and a transplant. In complications, there are increased risk for cancer. Okay, so two-year-old baby presents with hyperactivity, impaired growth, and abdominal pain, and constipation. And that blood smear. Can you see it? Kind of looks maybe like basophilic stippling. Lead poisoning. Good. How do we diagnose it? See how much lead is in there, right? That's how you diagnose it. How do we treat it? Kind of depends on how bad it is. Succimer is the oral version, right? Because it sucks to be a kid who eats lead. So oral succimer. If it's real, if the lead level is really high, you need to treat them with um, EDTA and dimercaptol IV. And screening. You don't screen everybody, but you screen the children between ages one and two if they have risk factors, if they live in a super old house, um, so forth and so on. Okay, so thrombocytopenia. 15-year-old female, here's your menses. Um, heavy menses, recurrent epistaxis, petechiae, and only low platelets. That's the only problem on the smear. 
low platelets, it's thrombocytopenia, and it's only thrombocytopenia, it's ITP. So that's ITP. Um, contrast that with the second case, 15-year-old female, recurrent epistaxis, heavy periods, petechiae, but the platelets are normal, but the bleeding time is increased. Von, von Willebrand's. So this is Von Willebrand's. Platelets are normal, but they are non-functional because of Von Willebrand's disease. Okay. Seven-year-old male, recurrent bruising, hematuria, and hemarthroses, and an increased PTT that corrects with mixing studies. What? <laughs> hemophilia. Good. Hemophilia. Do we treat that if it's mild with DDAVP? Uh, but now the replacement factors are so good, usually you just get recombinant factor 8 or 9, depending on what hemophilia you have. In a one-week-old newborn, born at home, comes in with bleeding from the umbilical stump and a bleeding diathesis. Vitamin K deficiency, good, be able to recognize that picture. Um, and lastly, a 9-year-old female with Wilson's disease and fulminant liver failure, what is the first clotting factor of it's depleted? Oh, so random. I'm being so mean. It's seven. It's seven. So the PTT is actually de increased first in liver disease because factor seven is depleted first. So if you've got liver problems, what two clotting factors are normal? Monwillibrands and its friend. It carries it around. Eight. Monwillibrands and factor eight are both made in the endothelial cells. Okay. So... A three-year-old child brought in with petechiae, abdominal pain, vomiting, and lethargy, had bloody diarrhea five days ago after eating hamburgers at a family picnic. There's your smear. What are those little thingies? Schistocytes. And labs reveal thrombocytopenia and an increase in creatinine. What's the problem? HUS. Very good. Most common cause? always the hamburgers, right? E. coli, 0157H7. And how do we treat it? No, then they'll die. We can't watch them. <laughs> Dial dialysis is the right answer. Early, early peritoneal dialysis. Um, the thing that's the absolute wrong answer is give platelets. You'll want to, right, because they're thrombocytopenic, and you're like, oh, they don't have any platelets. Let's give them some platelets. Don't do that, because the process that's consuming them in the first place will just consume the ones that you give them. So the treatment here is dialysis, peritoneal dialysis. Um, and actually, you can prevent it from happening if you don't give antibiotics for the original bloody diarrhea from the hamburger. Okay, so there's a kid's butt. Five-year-old child. Doesn't look like a five-year-old, does it, based on the butt? Maybe it does, I don't know. Five-year-old child, I'm not a butt connoisseur. A five-year-old child is brought in with purpura on his legs and buttocks, abdominal pain, joint pain, current jelly stool. Smear appears normal, coagulation studies are normal, electrolytes are normal. Yeah, this is HH, or HSP, henoch Schonlein purpura. And the most common cause? So IgA is, is what deposits in the skin. What, what can precipitate it? Yeah, it can follow an upper respiratory infection. And how do we treat this? Not much to do. Symptomatic treatment. Here's where we watch them. Okay. Mm, we'll do a couple more slides and we'll stop. New onset seizures, ataxia and headache, worse in the morning with vomiting for a month. Does that worry us? That's worrisome, right? What are we worried about? Tumor, tumor in the brain. Right, so we're worried about a brain tumor with those symptoms. What's the most common brain tumor in children? Astrocytoma is most common. And remember, in children, most brain tumors are infratentorial. Um, but with astrocytoma, at least, pilocytic type, um, they've got a very good prognosis after surgery. The second most common tumor that's got a terrible prognosis? Medulloblastoma. That's the small blue cell tumor. Um, it's also infratentorial. It can cause hydrocephalus because uh, often the tumor cells will block the fourth ventricle and lead to a non-communicating hydrocephalus, and it's got a terrible prognosis, even with treatment. 
Okay. Adolescents with height in the fifth percentile, bitemporal hemianopsia, calcifications in the cella turcica on MRI. Craniopharyngioma, and this is the remnant of Rathke's pouch. Remember that from embryology? It's nice when it all comes back, I think. Okay, so hypertensive child with an asymptomatic abdominal mass. Wilms, very good. These are asymptomatic. Kids with Wilms tumors don't look that sick. Their mom is just giving them a bath, and they're like, oh, there's a big lump in your abdomen. That's not normal. So what is Wilms tumor associated with? Hmm? I just can't hear you. Wagger. So aniridia, GU anomalies, hemihypertrophy, and also Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. I think they've got a 60 time more likely uh, chance to have a Wilms tumor. Um, best test for Wilms tumor? Abdominal CT. You got to see it. Uh, this tumor often metastasizes to the lung, so a chest X-ray is maybe the second or third step in uh, workup. Treatment for Wilms tumor? Well, it's cancer, so we'll cut it out, give them chemo and radiation. So this is the kid with the, the Wilms tumor is the kid with the asymptomatic abdominal mass. This fourth kid here has an abdominal mass that's tender, and the kid also has what they might describe as dancing eyes and dancing legs. This is neuroblastoma. And the diagnostic test here, you can look for increased um, homovalinic and valinomendeleic acid in the urine. Those are some um, tests you can do to confirm. Okay, so let's get through cancer and we'll call it a day. I think I just have a couple more slides. So this is a three-year-old girl with a limp and left leg pain, temperature, low-grade fever, hepatosplenomegaly, petechiae, and pallor, and the cells are shown. Do those, do those look like good, happy cells? No, the nucleus is huge, right? There's not a lot of cytoplasm. Those are not happy cells. So what's the most likely cancer here? ALL. This is ALL. Best test, to do a biopsy of the bone marrow to look for more than 30% of lymphoblasts there. Treat it with chemotherapy. What you want to remember about ALL is you have to add intrathecal methotrexate even if there are no neurologic symptoms because ALL very commonly recurs in the CNS and um, the CSF. So intrathecal met methotrexate is necessary. Poor prognostic factors here are if you're very young or very old in terms of children, so under, uh, under one or over 10, and if there are lots and lots of white blood cells. So uh, our second patient is a 14-year-old boy, enlarged painless rubbery nodes, uh, drenching fevers, and 10% weight loss. And this friend right here. Do those look like owl eyes? So that's Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the best test here, he's got all those rubbery nodes. What do you want to do? Mm, let's not aspirate them. Let's cut them out. Let's do an excisional biopsy to take a look at the um, histology of the node. And after you do the biopsy, what's the next best test? Yeah, we've got to stage it. So CT would be even better than chest X-ray. Um, to see where in the body the cancer has progressed. And then treatment, it's a cancer, so chemotherapy and radiation. So this is an unusual presentation. It's a seven-year-old girl with non-productive cough and a large anterior mediastinal mass on chest X-ray. Mm, it's not ALL. It's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So they often occur in the mediastinum, especially in children, and they can cause respiratory sy symptoms, which is why they're missed for so long. The doctor's like, oh, you have uh, pneumonia. Oh, you have a virus. Uh, but they're coughing because of um, compressive effects of the tumor. The best test here, it's a mass, so we want to biopsy it, and we treat it with surgical excision um, followed by radiation. Okay. Um, and I think it's 8 o'clock. And since this was supposed to end at 8, your brains are probably turned off, so we'll stop here. But I'll post the whole thing. So, Let me know if you have questions. I'll stick around. Thanks for coming.